Thanks, Shanti. Um, I'm happy to kick it off and then turn it over to Alex. Um, so, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Craig Oster, uh, he, him pronouns. I am the Vice President for Political Affairs at the League of Conservation Voters. Um, as you can see on your screen, uh, you know, LCV uh, works to, you know, fight for our planet and the people who live here by winning elections and then holding politicians accountable. And, you know, one of the most important things we do is endorse candidates and LCV endorses at the federal level. So primarily U.S. House and Senate races. And we work with our 32 plus state affiliates who make endorsements at the governor, state legislative and uh, local level. And we'll put in the chat how to find your local state affiliate. But a lot of them have similar processes to how we run our endorsements here at LCV. Uh, the most important thing is we have a questionnaire that covers uh, a wide span of the issues that we all care about on environment, conservation, environmental justice, and democracy. And so, you know, when candidates reach out to us, we share the questionnaire, we'll work with them, you know, on, on answering it, we'll do, you know, a relatively informal candidate interview, you know, talking about why the candidate's running, what what's really motivating them, uh, how their, how their uh, campaign is going, and talk about the importance of these issues and how they're used, utilizing them in their campaigns. We then, uh, you know, look at the questionnaire, candidates' records, you know, who are they running against, what are the, you know, political dynamics in their district, and are they running, you know, a strong, viable campaign, are they doing the right things, trying to raise money, putting together you know, staff um, and a team around them that can help them win. And then uh, for LCV, we make a, a recommendation at the staff level that goes to actually goes to a committee of our board who makes the ultimate decision. And I know, like I said, uh, we have a lot of state affiliates and they all have their own process, but they're all uh, pretty similar to that. And um, I think we have time for questions late and later and be happy to answer anything. But now I want to Turn it to my friend Alex. Yeah, thanks, Craig, and uh, thanks to the great people at LCV for hosting this. Um, I'm Alex. He him pronouns. I'm the senior political strategist for the Sierra Club. Um, what that means is I help manage our federal races. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through how we process and um, decide what candidates we endorse at the federal level. So Sierra Club has, I think, at this point, 66 chapters. Um, 50, one for each state, and then we have uh, a bunch in California where we're headquartered. Um, so our endorsement process begins at the state level. So if you're seeking our endorsement, you would reach out to our state chapters. Um, we have a questionnaire, federal questionnaire that we have uh, with questions about, you know, things from environmental justice to most recently we have questions around democracy reform and protecting the right to vote. Um, candidates complete the questionnaire and typically are interviewed by the chapter. And then there are two chapter committees that take a two thirds majority vote to approve the endorsement. At that point, the endorsement is sent to our national team where we have a subcommittee, including myself, of volunteer leaders at the Sierra Club and staff who would approve or reject the endorsement. Uh, typically, we look for things very similar to LCV. We look to see how good a candidate is at fundraising, what uh, their staff makeup is like. Um, we also look to see, of course, what their climate platform is and what their historic climate record may be. If it's a candidate who doesn't have much of a previous record, we'll normally ask them about kind of what their environmental priorities are once they get to Congress. Um, and then we kind of asked them about some of the Sierra Club values and how their campaign aligns with that. Uh, and at that point, if we're happy with the candidate, they get our endorsements and we send it back to the chapters and uh, typically mobilize our 3.8 million members and supporters in uh, getting that candidate elected. And I will pass it back I think, to Laurel. Oh, can I ask uh, Craig and Alex one question? 
um, getting an endorsement from LCB or Sierra Club can mean a lot of different things. And so uh, can you guys also just briefly talk about how do you make the decisions about what an endorsement comes with? Sure. Um, uh, so we typically, after we've endorsed, that's when, you know, LCB would make, you know, be able to make a PAC contribution from, from our PAC. And, you know, we typically try to, you know, give everyone, uh, you know, anywhere from, you know, a thousand to ten thousand uh, dollars, depending on whether you're in the primary, still past the primary, how competitive the race is. You know, uh, we definitely skew towards giving, uh, you know, some more more money to those folks who are in the most competitive races that could, you know, kind of help make the difference in control of the House or the Senate. Um, we also for every candidate, work with them on publicly releasing the endorsement and publicizing it on social media. We also send an email to all of our members in the district, encouraging them to, you know, vote and volunteer and support for that um, that candidate. Most of the candidates we uh, endorse also end up on Give Green, which is our candidate fundraising platform that we do with our friends at NRDC Action Fund, where. Uh, donors can go and directly contribute to the campaigns of the candidates. And that is actually for both state and federal candidates. Uh, and then the there's a lot of decisions that get made on the other side of the firewall about independent expenditures. Um, but the last thing that LCV kind of can do for those candidates is we do for, you know, in about 12 to 15 places each cycle, we have field organizers on the ground that we plug into the coordinated campaign and they help recruit our members to volunteer. And usually those are in some of the most competitive House and Senate places. And I'll just sort of echo uh, a similar thing from Sierra Club, which is, you know, we look, of course, to donate a fair amount of money to candidates we endorse in really tough districts, of course. Um, and we also run a similar coordinated program where we mobilize our members and deploy members of staff to campaigns on the coordinated side in the last two weeks of an election to help uh, get out the vote for them. Great. Well, questions are coming into Q and A. If, um, if panelists want to answer them as we um, as we go through the presentation, feel free. Otherwise, we can also we have time at the end here for Q and A. Um, so thank you, Craig and Alex. Um, and now we will. Oh, I don't think we're going to state first. I think we're going to do democracy first. So we'll come back to that. Um, and Hilda, you want to introduce yourself, your work, and then also talk us through voting rights and state priorities? Of course. Hi, everybody. My name is Hilda Nusete. I'm the Director of Civic Engagement at the Legal Conservation Voters. Uh, I am originally from Venezuela. My pronouns are she, her, hers, ella. And uh, I'm based in beautiful Denver, Colorado. Um, as we get started, really, um, voting rights and, the, and, and democracy, such an interesting aspect for LTV, the legal conservation voters to really undertake. Um, but we really believe that um, to work and create a more just and equitable democracy that was responsible for all people and their will to protect the planet. When we improve access and trust to our democracy systems, communities in this country that has traditionally been left out of our decision-making process can reclaim their rightful influence, resulting in a system that responds to all people in order to protect one of our most uh, critical moments in, this, in, in the planet, which is environmental challenges. Um, so as we are moving into this space, really we have made um, democracy um, a third leg of the stool for climate battles. When we look at LCV, we're looking at climate, uh, racial justice and equity, and democracy as three aspects that in order to be able to build um, a better world in so many aspects. Um, we understand that I think, especially as we are moving into this space, that strengthening and defending our democracy through just and equitable voting laws and representation at all levels of government. Which means, for example, recently we came out with a statement that only endorsements 
consider we will only be considering endorsements to those who take all necessary measures to pass key voting rights and pro-democracy measures uh, currently being debated in the Senate. This along with the Latino Victory Fund, um, the uh, and different organizations that have been able to be part of our coalition, including Let America Vote, Black Voters Matter Fund, Public Collective PAC, and Citizens United, being able to take a strong stand that moving forward, democracy is one of our key pillars in order to fight um, climate injustice and environmental degradation in our country. Um, one of our missions as we're moving forward is really passing comprehensive uh, federal legislation around democracy that advances and protects voting rights at all costs. Uh, and in re also restoring voting rights, the Voting Rights Act. Also the John Lewis Act, which I know we're gonna, uh, one of our next speakers is gonna be able to talk a little bit more on our federal priorities. Um, but really being able to secure a pro-democracy actions from the Biden and Harris administration, which in some aspects we've seen some movement, but being able to assure that that is being uh, present as we're talking about climate and democracy hand in hand. Please Shanti, if we can go into the next slide. Which we understand that not all action comes from the federal level. So we have dedicated our time similar as you will hear around our Clean Energy for All program, which was a, a 10 year campaign or, or a long term campaign, including multiple of our states to fight climate uh, change and to be able to bring a priority of climate policy. We want to implement a coordinated conservation voter movement, 10 year state level democracy campaign that is going to be grounded, uh, grounded in guiding principles and really publish set of pro democracy anti voter suppression policies and priorities that we want to be able to mobilize. Um, and being able to aim at closing the voter registration and participation gap, um, especially as we see it being such a racial gap in, in, in our country, uh, in which communities of color technically tend to be left behind at the polling place, but also when we look at environmental justice overall. So what does that mean? Really changing the prior, not completely change the priorities, but adding democracy as a priority in local endorse endorsement processes at the state level. Uh, that previously you would have not expected getting a democracy question in one of our state level um, endorsement processes. And this is something that's gonna be showing more and more. Um, and really being able to, as we're looking into this, what thorough legislation, ballot initiatives or local election administration policies, candidates have been able to also push support or being able to elevate in some of these spaces and really being able to elevate in our local level um, pro-democracy reform and defending against voter suppression, and how do we build this as a long-term campaign to 2024. Uh, we know that the 2020 election was extremely difficult when we saw when um, voting rights and even access to democracy with long waiting lines, and 2021 was a year in which we saw uh, direct attacks to democracy in Georgia, in Texas, in Arizona. We've seen them time after time, and I think our states have been able to really see clear distinctions and clear lines um, that voting rights and are intrinsically connected to environmental justice and how one community that has been historically been disenfranchised when it comes to uh, environmental justice has been just disenfranchised at the voting place. Um, so I can, if you have any questions, I can ask them at the end, but uh, I'll take it to our next. Thank you, Hilda. Um, I believe now we're gonna go to uh, Bill and Laurel. Um, so Bill and Laurel, please introduce yourselves, um, talk about your roles, uh, share just a little bit about your roles, and then um, we're gonna go into state and uh, local priorities. So Bill, why don't we start with you on clean energy for all? Great. And Shanti, do you want me to, each of us to do introductions and then speak or? Yeah, that sounds good. Great. Um, Bill Holland, I'm the Senior Director for State Policy Advocacy and Network-Wide Campaigns at LCV. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I lead our um, state level advocacy focused primarily on climate and clean energy. And I am Laurel Javers. Um, I use they, them pronouns. I'm based uh, also in Denver, Colorado, and I am the um, associate director of our political program, 
um, with an emphasis on state and local races. Great. Um, so again, Bill Holland, um, excited to talk with you all about how, the intersection of our policy advocacy work and folks running for office. So um, as Craig and Hilda noted, um, we have 32 state leagues all across the country. Um, we recognize that the political and the issue opportunities in each of those states is different um, for many reasons. Um, in 2018, as Hilda noted, we launched our National Clean Energy for All campaign. The campaign recognized the importance um, and the centrality of state and local decision makers on solving our climate crisis. Um, the, when we launched the campaign, um, the, we were focused on getting state and local communities to shift to 100% clean energy um, with a lot of leadership from uh, the Sierra Club and their Ready for 100 campaign. Um, and just, I mean, as context, the, the impact of state and local communities on, on policy, America's Pledge has found that 37% um, of our climate emissions can be reduced by state and local action by 2030. UC Berkeley um, has done analysis that half of the clean energy on the grid right now is due to state renewable portfolio standards. Um, so we know that states and cities are central to solving the climate crisis. Um, when we launched CIFA, we also recognized that, that we can make progress everywhere. That progress wasn't limited to blue states, um, wasn't limited to the most you know, traditionally progressive or left-wing places in the country, but in fact, um, people everywhere supported transitioning off fossil fuels, protecting their communities and advancing clean energy. Um, and in fact, as part of our campaign, even in um, December, uh, in Nebraska, the Nebraska Public Power District, um, which was is led by a number of candidates that we helped elect and support, um, committed to carbon-free emissions by 2050, um, which follows commitments from the o Omaha Public Power District and the Lincoln Public Power District. So um, one of those pieces that recognizes the power of making progress everywhere. As part of that work, um, we've asked candidates, um, this through each of our state leagues, to commit to 100% clean energy. And over the last two election cycles, over 1,300 local, state, and federal candidates have committed to 100% clean energy. Um, next slide. Um, the value of that isn't just in getting candidates to commit to it, but it's actually translating it into policy commitments and progress. So as a result of that campaign, 15 states um, have committed to 100% clean energy. 40% of uh, people in this country now live in places committed to 100% clean energy. And like I said, with a ton of leadership from the Ready for 100 campaign, the Sierra Club leads. Um, and we've watched policies strengthen those commitments over recent years. And so just to highlight um, a couple, you know, I just talked about Nebraska, um, which, you know, we always think of as, you know, sort of, hey, that's interesting. Um, this is exactly demonstrating that we can make progress everywhere. Um, but also want to flag where we're really innovating um, as a coalition of just how we write policy and what it means. So in Illinois this year, um, advocates all across the state passed the um, Climate and Equitable Jobs Act um, that calls for transitioning, um, you know, a Midwestern state to 100% clean energy with provisions that center racial equity and economic justice in the core of the policy. It has um, funding for the transition of coal communities. Um, over $80 million in investments for the clean, for clean energy workforce. Um, it also invests um, tens of million dollars in transportation electrification with, with nearly half of that, 45% of the funds devoted to low-income communities and communities of color. Um, and it was written with the input of communities most impacted um, by fossil fuel pollution, racially diverse communities and communities of color and low-income communities. So um, our state league in partnership with groups across the country held over 200 meetings across the state um, in all 99 Senate districts to write those policies um, and to identify the priorities that um, would get written into that. And I share that today because I think one of the core um, roles of those running for office um, is to make sure that you're you know, standing up for your communities, participating, and then also making sure that we're actually, as we strengthen our climate and clean energy and um, democracy laws, that we're creating 
formal processes for the participation of communities impacted by those laws. Um, next slide. Um, and so just a couple of highlights. I mean, I think Craig noted this, each of our states looks different. And so I, I wouldn't come here with like, here's the three policies that if you support, like check that box, right? It's not that. Um, but just a couple things that decision makers at all levels um, could can make an impact on. And I just wanted to flag, um, you know, with leadership from our LCD's CHISPA program, um, we've watched uh, a total transformation and momentum on electric school buses across the country. This is part of um, a number of conversations at the federal level, um, but then also numerous local decision makers made incredible progress even in the last year. Um, so in New York City in uh, October, the city council voted to make all school buses um, in the city electric by 2035. Um, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland, um, and back in February, the, January, the school district made a commitment to 326 electric school buses, recognizing that this is where our kids um, are most, you know, are every day interacting with um, the diesel pollution from school buses. Um, states are doing, cities are doing things like local climate action plans. Also, uh, a huge amount of local decision makers can leverage the power of their cities and their role as leaders um, to push utilities and public ut public service commissions to eliminate fossil fuels and to use that authority to do that. Tons of progress at the federal level of investments that um, local decision makers can use to invest in climate resiliency around clean water and replacing lead pipes. Um, and then I, you know, I mentioned this with Illinois. I think it is core to the role of all decision makers at this point to make sure that when we're writing laws that we're actually creating formal processes that engage the communities most impacted um, by policies, those who are traditionally left behind, um, and those um, in low income community, communities and communities of color to make sure that there's like a formal consultation or process for engagement. And then also that when we're making investments um, as elected officials that we're driving investments into those communities as well. Um, so I will stop there. Oh, the last thing I just wanna say, um, as a recommendation for those running for office, like we don't have a like, here's here's the toolkit to go run, um, but there are a lot out there. Um, and so just a couple, you know, Emerald Cities um, is one organization that is doing great work on local climate policy and has a number of um, documents that I think folks can look at, climate mayors, but there are a ton of resources out there. And I would encourage folks running for office to, you know, use Google a little bit to identify what are the sort of progressive ambitious ways that you can center racial equity in equitable climate solutions. Um, and that's the sort of thing that will gain the attention of our state leads. I'll turn it over to Laurel. Thank you, or Bill. Shanti. Laurel, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, so very similar to LCV, uh, we do not have a standard like at the state and local level, um, list of policies uh, because you know what what works in one state might not be feasible in another state um, but you know overall what we want from our state and local leaders is a commitment to keep oil and gas in the ground um, a commitment to hold corporate polluters accountable for when they you know dump toxic contaminants in um, our our water systems um, and a just transition to a 100 renewable energy um, and so I'll kind of highlight um, across the myriad of places that we work in what that looks like. Um, so for instance, in New Mexico, where, um, you know, one, we're trying to keep oil and gas in the ground at the Permian Basin um, and shut down some coal plants. Um, one of the things that we need to consider and we need our elected officials to consider is that um, those are very significant economic drivers in indigenous communities. And that's part of the just transition and racial equity piece that we are really um, centering in our state and local priorities is how are our elected officials balancing the need for us to take aggressive action on climate, but to do so in a way that does not place the burden um, on communities of color, on indigenous communities and historically um, underinvested communities in, in more urban areas. And so one of the things that we really encourage all of our candidates to do before they run for office is to sit down and have a meeting with LCV, with the Sierra Club, and get a sense for um, what the priorities are in your very local community. Um, because, you know, 
passing really great legislation is wonderful, but the implementation piece is really hard. And that's really where a lot of our state and local priority work is, is the implementation of um, these, these really big priorities. Um, in, in other places, you know, one of the things that we want to see from our candidates is um, a lot of commitment to not just passing good legislation, but being in authentic relationship with the communities that are most impacted. Um, because of the Sierra Club, we really believe that the people closest to a problem know best how to fix it. Um, and so we wanna see our candidates um, who, who are prioritizing clean energy and are prioritizing renewable energy um, investments to be in relationship with low income and communities of color. Um, because I think a lot in a lot of ways that has been missing from the environmental movement. And um, our chapters really lead this work. Um, you know, at National, I, I, I support chapters in doing it, um, our 66 chapters in doing this work, but I really take a back seat to what they have defined as the priorities. So we really encourage folks to be in relationship with their chapters. Um, and, you know, I, I will say, um, as you're filling out your questionnaires for the Sierra Club, as you're going through your interview process, um, I don't know, or I don't have a really good answer to that is also a very acceptable answer because we want to work with you and we want to help you develop your policy positions um, and to get you in touch with the right people who can help you to get these um, policies across the finish line. Um, you know, all of that is to say, um, we, this is our endorsement and our priorities are very important, but more importantly, I think is the relationships that we wanna have with candidates um, and with elected officials. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's gonna be dynamic, it's gonna be changing, especially as, you know, I, I don't think I'm shocking anyone, 2022, we're probably not going to win a ton of state legislatures. So that makes city councils and county commissions even more important. Um, and where we're gonna see significant investment for our state and local priorities as we shift and try to find other places where we can have an impact on climate. As Bill said, most of these decisions um, are happening at the city council level, at the school board level. Um, and this is really a way for us to leverage our people power to get clean energy um, in all communities. Thanks, Laurel. Um, I dropped the chat and I'll drop, I'll drop it again for people who arrived later for our state affiliates into the chat. And perhaps if there's a similar list for the Sierra Club chapters, um, that could also be dropped into the chat. Um, and we are going to get to hear more from the folks who've already spoken. We get to Q&A. Um, but for now, we're going to move on to um, federal priorities. But I did want to say we have a colleague, Jaleesa Giles, who works for Florida Conservation Voters, who wanted to join us today, but had a last minute conflict come up. So sorry she couldn't. She would, We build her. Sorry she's not here, uh, but hopefully we'll bring her on another webinar. Um, so colleague um, Matthew Davis, if you could introduce yourself and your role at LCV. Um, and you, you're on my screen, you look a little dark, and I'm not sure um, why. I don't know if other people are, are seeing Matt kind of in a reddish hue. Um, but in any event, glad you're here. Please introduce yourself and then tell us about federal priorities. Great. Thanks so much, Shanti. Um, and apologies for my, my less than ideal lighting situation. Um, uh, maybe it's the green screen in the background. I, I just, I love having the, um, you know, we support clean energy uh, jobs um, background. Um, my name is Matthew Davis, and I'm the Senior Director of Government Affairs here at the League of Conservation Voters. Um, I'm based out of Washington, D.C., um, and I um, am really happy to be here with you all today. Hopefully, this, this is slightly better lighting. Um, <laughs> good. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, um, you know, what I'd like to do is very, just very briefly through, um, walk through some of the top uh, federal uh, legislative and administrative priorities that we at LCV see for, for 2022. Um, uh, in, in talking with um, Alex at the Sierra Club um, earlier, many of these legislative priorities are their legislative priorities as well. The community has really come together, especially the environmental community and with other, um, you know, with other issue areas, whether it's um, folks fighting for 
um, rights for um, people who are here and do not have legal documentation to be here, um, but are fighting to get it, um, whether it's um, those who are seeking to um, ameliorate the conditions of um, the working poor in this country, the, the, the labor unions, there are a lot of organizations coming together around sort of uh, this large set of priorities, especially legislatively. So, um, you know, as my colleague Ilda was uh, walking through, there's a lot of focus right now at the federal level on uh, voting rights protect and democracy protections. Um, for those of you who, who follow the news out of DC, there was not terribly good news yesterday from um, Senator Sinema and Senator Manchin about um, adjusting the rules of the Senate to make sure that Democrats could pass um, protections for voting rights and, and to safeguard our democracy. I, I don't think that the, the chapter is closed on that yet. Um, we're gonna see things play out over um, you know, over today and over the weekend and then um, next week, especially. Um, I haven't given up hope yet that there'll be some pathway found, but it is challenging to see exactly how that pathway um, will be found and, and, and how they will get there. I, I mentioned, you know, those two Democratic senators by name, but also important to note that the entire caucus of Republicans um, is blocking efforts to protect the you know, sanctity of the vote and um, people's access to the vote. Uh, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska is the only Republican senator who um, voted to, to allow a vote on um, Voting Rights Act um, protections. Um, so they're, <laughs> they, are, they are the real problem. Um, and Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema are just adding to that. Um, so uh, we, will, we will see what happens on voting rights. Uh, this, even if this push does not succeed over the next week and a half, it doesn't make it any less important. And there will be other attempts to thread the needle or, or find ways to uh, protect people's ability to vote. Um, onto the Build Back Better Act. This is the, the large um, economic recovery and climate and clean energy and environmental justice package that um, has been getting a lot of attention um, and we have been pushing to move across the finish line. Um, we thought we were very close before the, um, before a little bit before Christmas um, last year and getting this across the finish line in the Senate. This has already been passed by the House and um, would be transformational for so many communities and so many of the efforts for advancing 100% clean electricity, um, electric vehicles and other zero emission vehicles, whether it's trucks and buses um, or um, you know, machinery at ports and, and airports. Um, it also clearly, um, if, if folks have followed this at all, clearly contains important social programs as well. I won't speak as much to those because those are a little bit outside of um, our realm here at LCB, um, but very important programs, whether it's free pre-K, national pre-K, um, whether it's uh, the child tax credit, um, increases in Medicare reimbursements and, and coverage, um, and, you know, and, and a variety of other things, family leave. Um, so there, there are a lot of pieces to the Build Back Better Act, and I'm going to talk primarily about the climate, clean energy, and environmental justice ones. Um, those investments make up about $555 billion worth of the package, which is about $1.7 trillion over, and this is over 10 years. Um, so this, is, this would be transformational. It would get us on the path to cut emissions by 50% by 2030 um, when added to um, administrative actions and, and continued activity at the state level, which as Bill, um, uh, Bill and Laurel just talked about is really critical. Um, and important and has, has really helped um, push the needle, especially um, during the Trump years uh, when there really wasn't a lot of action. Um, there was only negative ne action in the wrong direction at the federal level. Okay, we can go to the next slide, John. So um, a little bit more on the Build Back Better Act. The, 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 the very heart of the incentives um, in this package are, um, uh, tax incentives primarily for 
clean electricity, um, clean transportation, more efficient and cleaner buildings, uh, clean manufacturing. Um, that makes up uh, a little over 300, maybe $325 billion of the, of the package over those 10 years. It is absolutely essential that this get across the finish line and that we continue to build out the solar, the wind, the you know, battery storage and other clean energy storage um, and, and strengthen our grid and make it more resilient so that folks can have access to clean electricity, that we build clean, electric, clean energy jobs, um, that we have a grid to plug into for our electric vehicles, for our electric heat pumps that are gonna keep our homes comfortable all year round. Um, and so this is really the, the absolutely essential piece to being able to reduce emissions and transition um, our economy. Um, there are major environmental justice investments in this package as well. Um, as, as with sort of everything in this bill, there's kind of too much just to list here. Um, I will drop in the chat after I'm done chatting, after I'm done talking, um, a link to our a fact sheet that we've put out. The Sierra Club has also put out an even more extensive fact sheet that um, I'd also recommend for sort of reading up on, all right, what's in this? What's in, what, written in a way that's easy to understand with bullets. Um, but here are some highlights from environmental justice. Um, there's environmental justice and climate justice block grants on the order of $3 billion over 10 years, which would be a major infusion of money for communities that um, really need and deserve that funding to help um, protect their community from the impacts of um, you know, decades of environmental uh, racism and also um, climate impacts that are hitting their communities much worse. Um, uh, funding for electric trucks um, and other heavy duty vehicles, electrification and other um, cleaning up um, at ports um, and goods movement areas, better air monitoring in communities, removing lead pipes from schools um, and increased uh, funding for um, collecting informing the public and collecting input on projects and reviewing those projects so that they're not negatively impacting communities. Um, the, the National Environmental Policy Act really requires that the federal government do this. And um, the, you know, the Trump administration, of course, tried to attack it and, and weaken it. Um, the Biden administration has taken some steps to, to build it back. But this bill would also add funding so that agencies are able to um, more robustly engage communities um, and in a way where they are on an equal footing. So that's that's a very important piece um, we see uh, in the Build Back Better Act. The Civilian Climate Corps has also gotten a, a, a lot of attention, and I think it's very you know worth mentioning here. Um, it would be a way for folks to get jobs, especially in those um, communities that have not seen the kind of investment that they deserve, um, in low-income communities and communities of color, to get jobs helping to build climate resiliency, helping to protect public lands um, and, uh, and secure communities against the impacts of climate change. And I would be remiss if I didn't say there's a, also a good deal of funding in here for climate smart agriculture and forestry um, and for urban parks, in, especially in places where there are not nearly enough parks um, and access to open space. Um, so that's, that's a bit about Build Back Better Act. I will very quickly talk about FY22 appropriations. I know this is like got to be the most boring topic, right? Like getting <laughs> getting the federal government the money it needs to run, to operate. Um, right now, the federal government is um, partway into the uh, fiscal year 2022. It's running on what is called a continuing resolution or a CR, which basically holds over funding levels from um, the previous fiscal year, which I know it wasn't that long ago, it's hard to remember and, and recall the horror of the Trump administration, but these are Trump administration level budgets. They are very, very low in terms of his, historically and what kinds of problems that federal agencies are dealing with and helping communities and states with all across the country. It, um, it, it would be a real, real tragedy and disaster to not increase funding in these federal government agencies. Um, and this you know, enables them to deliver better services to people, provide greater number of grants and funding levels for state, um, you know, state departments um, and, and local, you know, local agencies as well. 
And so we are fighting and, you know, with the Sierra Club and others to ensure that it, the continuing resolution does not stretch the entire rest of the year, that by February 18th, the, the, the Democrats and Republicans come together on some sort of agreement on increased funding levels for um, federal government to operate and to operate in a way that's actually doing their job and protecting protecting folks. And you know, we of course look at it more in the environmental context, but this applies to uh, sort of across the board, um, federal government really running um, hobbled by, by um, well, actually, you know, more than just the Trump administration in terms of how long it's been that they've had low budgets. Okay, I'll stop there and go to the next slide. Um, and this is just a listing of what we see as some of the top environmental administrative actions that we are expecting and, and pushing for out of the Biden-Harris administration. I will not walk through all of these because I think I've spoken um, quite long enough. Uh, you can see the bullets here and I'm happy to answer questions about them. Great. Thank you, um, everybody. We do have some questions both in the chat and the Q&A. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to share some tips. Um, we have a lot of people on this call who are going to be running either this year or sometime soon. Um, and so we wanted to just share these uh, before we kind of get to Q&A. So I um, encourage you, I think this was already mentioned, to research and reach out to your state league or your local Sierra Club chapter. Ask them to see their endorsement questionnaires. They may tell you, we don't have our questionnaire yet for this year, that's fine. You can ask them to see the one from previous. My experience is that they don't change that much. They don't tend to change that much from cycle to cycle. Um, now, there may be some new questions about democracy rights because it's such a big issue right in the country right now, um, but you can also ask to see previous ones if they're not ready. Build relationships as much as you can. So, um, you know, sometimes with local chapters, um, it's just a few people, depending on the size of the chapter, that make these decisions. So ask people to go on coffee dates, show up at the chapter meetings if you can. Um, you know, in some places that's not gonna be in person, that'll be online, which is fine. It's not the same thing, but it's good, um, better than nothing. Um, and then just know that some state leagues and some Sierra Club chapters may not endorse in your particular race. Um, and so that's okay. It's still worth getting to know them because if they like you, you can ask them, hey, what are some other ways you might be able to help? Maybe they can make an introduction to you uh, to an elected official that um, they're close with. Maybe they can refer you to a PAC or a donor that they have a relationship with. So it's worth building those relationships, especially for those of you who are thinking of running for even higher office someday. Um, and then be honest about what you don't know, right? During these endorsement um, interviews, uh, it's okay to say, I need to, I need to know more about that and then get back to you. Um, it's better than trying to bluff your way through. Um, and then the endorsement interviews are not a test. They're an opportunity to learn more, right? Um, and then just make sure that your website, your campaign materials, whatever you're leaving behind or, or is intended to represent you is an honest reflection of your environmental values and your priorities. Because if you talk a good game in an endorsement interview and they go to your website and there's nothing on there, it's a little suspicious. <laughs> So those are just some tips. And then um, I'll also drop a link. Um, we run a candidate academy. I run an academy um, for LCV. And uh, today's the deadline to apply. We're going to extend it a couple of days. Um, so if those of you who do not have a, a plan yet to get good candidate training, um, please consider it. Um, and then with that, we'll open up for Q&A. So I'm actually going to stop sharing so that everybody can see each other. And um, we can, um, I'll just read, I think I'll start with the chat um, and I'll let you guys decide who wants to dig in on which questions. Um, thank you, Matt, for dropping that information and more about Build Back Better and the two, um, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of people named Sierra Club, so I can't tell who's trying to speak when it says Sierra Club raise hand. So I'll, I'll see if I can uh, figure that out. Um, Somebody asked, what is the last deadline you're referring to? Um, we are recruiting now for our uh, LCV Candidate Academy. So if you don't have a training plan uh, yet for your candidacy, um, please consider that. I'll drop the chat and I'll drop in the chat in a minute. So one question is, do we have any concerns about what Republicans might do? I, with, with a, I, I can't tell if that's supposed to say without filibuster or um, with a filibuster. So I don't know if anybody wants to tackle that one. Uh, does Murkowski favor a filibuster carve out for the John Lewis Act? 
So I don't know, Matt I can, or Craig. I can or take, Alex. Okay. I'm happy to take those too. Um, the, uh, you know, I think there is there is real um, real reason to cons to have concern that the Republicans might do away with the filibuster so that they can um, pass legislation if when they um, are back in the majority in the Senate. Um, that to me is not a reason for Democrats not to do it because I think the Republicans will do it regardless of what, whether the Democrats do it or not. Um, uh, Senator Murkowski has not to date said that she would support changing the filibuster to get to a vote on the John Lewis, um, John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which she did support moving to a vote on, on that bill, but she, um, she has not made any statement that I'm aware of about, um, about filibuster reform in order to, to get to that vote. Um, so I'm not, not totally sure about that, kind of doubt that would happen, but one could maybe hope. Okay. And then is Sierra Club still circulating the mayor's pledge on climate change? Um, I can take that. I, I believe it, you know, we, it would, it would vary by chapter, but if a chapter is going to endorse in a mayoral race, um, we would hope that uh, that mayor is committed to renewable energy. Um, in certain areas, we know that asking a mayor or a candidate for mayor to sign on to something like that could actually um, hurt their chances. So we, we try to be a little bit nimble with our expectations around signing on to something that, that could actually be a liability. Um, and pledges are nice, but um, we would like to see candidates actually do something. I think a lot of times candidates will make a pledge, say they made a pledge whenever they're pressed on it, say I pledge to do this thing, and they never actually do that thing. So uh, we, we prefer, you know, in the endorsement process to kind of have a, a um, conversation about what their policy priorities are and, and kind of ask them to show their homework versus, um, you know, just signing on to a pledge. Okay, uh, let's see here. I think there's more questions in the chat, but we can, I guess we can go over to Q&A now. Um, I think the first question from Q&A was, how long does the endorsement process typically take? So once you guys have received a, an endorsement questionnaire or filled out questionnaire, how long does the process between accepting the deadline for accepting questionnaires and making those and announcing those decisions? So I can answer that just for Sierra Club um, because it's volunteer driven uh, frequently it can be somewhat of a longer process as it takes getting people who are not paid to work in this field together um, and using their valuable free time to get these endorsements started. Um, that being said, it does depend on the urgency. Sometimes um, we're able to expedite an endorsement, um, but we are typically, at least on the federal side, a little bit slower to put it mildly, um, in getting our endorsements done than other groups. Uh, I would say there's no like simple answer to that. It definitely depends on, you know, what point we're at in the cycle, you know, whether there's a contested primary or not, um, you know, it, it just sort of depends race by race. Um, we typically do endorsements on a rolling basis and our board will meet monthly. I do know that for our state leagues, I think they tend to have it a little more structured where, you know, they might wait until after the filing closes and then send questionnaires to, you know, every candidate and then have a certain time period in which they're doing candidate interviews. So I think it really does vary just like group group by group and, and like I said, kind of how far along we are in, in the election cycle. Okay, um, let's see here. I'm stepping into a more active role to support the local group's political work and the political chair has asked for template uh, Sierra Club and LCV questionnaires to help guide the process. 
I had previously been involved in questionnaire development at the chapter, but are there any standard questions that LCV and Sierra Club encourage all questionnaires to include, regardless of whether local, state, or federal? Um, I can take that for the Sierra Club um, and then whoever at, at LCV want, wants to take that. Um, we do not have standard questions um, that we would see, well, uh, we have some basics. Like, do you believe climate change is real? Um, do you support, like, like, you know, the kind of basic, um, like, is this a person who we should read question two for? Um, but beyond that, we really encourage our local folks um, to generate questionnaires based on the work that they are doing in their locale. Um, for the federal questionnaire, our national political team and our um, federal policy team write that questionnaire. Um, you, you know, chapters can't deviate from it, but they can add up to two questions, kind of, again, based on what's happening in their locale. Um, the reason we don't ever do um, a kind of top-down, like, standard, these are the questions you should be asking, um, is one, um, you might be in a state that has passed 100% uh, renewable energies, and so now the goal is um, implementation. So that's going to be a totally different set of questions. It doesn't make sense to ask a question about something that's already been passed. The other reason being um, we do work in places where um, some of our policy platforms are just not viable. And if, a, and, and like candidates are, are just not going to, like, I'm thinking of Alaska. Um, we could never ask a candidate in Alaska to not take money from the oil and gas industry. Um, and we have to make friends somehow. And so we really want to encourage the questionnaire to be um, a dialogue between political committees and the work happening at the chapter um, and rooted in what is politically um, feasible in the states where these, and in the city councils and the county commissions where these questionnaires are being generated from. Craig, Matt, Ilda, wanna share about our questionnaires? Sure, um, I would say that, uh, you know, we tend to keep our questionnaire uh, strictly to issue questions. I know there are other groups that, uh, you know, also will ask about, you know, how, you know, things like how your fundraising and um, other information maybe about the district, um, but we like to, you know, kind of keep that separate and just focus on the issues. And I'd say for the first time ever, Bill maybe will help me with the, the year. Um, we, within the last couple of years, for the first time ever, we had both nationally LCV and all of our state leagues include the, a question about 100% uh, clean energy uh, by 2050, which back then felt ambitious. Now, you know, we know we have to go faster. Um, we're also working this cycle, you know, to try to get all of our state leagues to include a relatively similar question around democracy and voting rights. But you can't really ask this exact same question at the state and local level as you do at the federal level on that. But, um, you know, generally, I think, you know, making sure, uh, you know, the questionnaire like Laurel said covers local issues is really important. Hilda? Hi folks. Yeah, I was, I will add a thing as part as, as we have mentioned, sort of our, one of our legs of this tool, racial justice and equity, and being able to have a clear connection and understanding of the communities that you will be serving within that role. I think that is something that can be overlooked uh, and especially being able that we get into caught into the numbers and how, what's the percentage to, to win and all these pieces. But I think one of the aspects that people tend to forget in some of these questionnaires is people. Why we first run for office. And I will really wanna emphasize that of why the environment and why protecting the people within your district and the issues that are being elevated within your district and your connection to those groups that are sometimes are voiceless or not heard by elected officials because they might not have the capital, the lobbying power to be up in the front, you know, in, in some of those conversations. I'll say the same thing when it comes to voting rights. We know that disproportionately impacted communities in the environment are the same that have been historically disenfranchised. Um, so I think being able to have an honest conversation about 
the people that you're willing to protect and be a voice and advocate for that you're going to be representing. Um, sometimes it doesn't come through in a lot of these spaces and that honesty and laying that out and being clear about your intentions for people, by the people, uh, it's so important. Thanks, Santa. So here's an easy one. Uh, how does LCB and Sierra Club deal with the steady stream of misinformation and disinformation about climate change and energy production? I'll take a I'll take a first crack. Um, I think you know our our communication shops are are always um, putting out information about um, how um, how climate change is impacting our communities, underscoring just just how costly the impacts are. Last year alone, there were 20 climate fuel disasters that cost over $1 billion each. Um, that, those 20 added up to over $145 billion in costs. Um, and this is, this is the costs that are easy to quantify costs um, for our country just from those disasters. So um, we certainly will look to underscore that. Um, we certainly, um, you know, whether it's tweeting or putting out statements when, um, when we feel like the record needs to be corrected or, or that, dis, that disinformation or misinformation needs to be collected, corrected. And we also are, um, you know, joined with our partners in calling out corporations and um, associations of corporations that try to say really nice things about climate change and then do something completely different or, um, you know, spend a lot of money uh, to lobby and undermine the efforts that we're trying to, to, to get accomplished to, to tackle climate change. So it is, um, it is not easy. Um, it takes all of us uh, working at it, chipping away at it. Um, but, you know, we certainly, we certainly, we certainly try. Um. And very similar to what you all do at LCV, I, you know, I will say comms 101, we don't ever debate idiots on their, um, their terms and with their, uh, you know, message. Um, so we kind of ignore the lies. Um, and we just lead with this is what climate is doing to our communities. Um, and this is, this is the possibility for a future with a clean energy um, economy. Um, and we, we really just stay focused on, on our values and our mission. Um, and we might just throw, you know, out, um, you know, talk about someone being a climate denier. Um, but, you know, we, we really try to stick to our message and our values and, and not debate um, climate deniers on facts because you're never going to win that. Okay. Um, I see people, there's people who have their raised their hands. I'm going to I'm going to take the questions that are in Q&A first, and then we can go to individual folks. Um, what can I do as the Sierra Club political chair, group level political chair? How high or far down can I go? State House, Senate, County Supervisor, City Council, ballot referendum, referendums, et cetera. Either of our Sierra Club folks want to answer this one? Just reading it here. Um, there's not really a limit to where you would go if you're on the Paul Com. Um, it's outlined in the guidelines, which I'm happy to send at the end of this as well. Thanks, Alex. Okay. Um, in 2001, I led a local effort to coordinate local endorsement processes between local affiliates um, and the chapter. Uh, we used 20, for 20 years, we used joint questionnaires, held joint interviews, and then caucus separately to independently decide and recommend on endorsements. How widespread is this kind of cooperation and is it encouraged by the national guidance? Um, I can take that. Um... We, we try to encourage our decision-making process to be collaborative. Um, I'm not sure how widespread it is um, beyond, you know, kind of where this happened in the past. Um, but one thing that's important to note about our guidelines is, you know, we don't, the vote needs to be independent of any other group. Um, but obviously a lot of our work happens in coalition. So we, we would just like to encourage our chapters 
to um, be in, in dialogue with other environmental partners um, and kind of be in conversation about, um, you know, who we're endorsing and making sure that, you know, especially when we're getting involved in primaries, um, we're not um, kind of working against one another. Great. Um, can we work at the level of school boards and park boards? So I can start this as a school board member. I serve on the school board in Oakland, California. Yes, you can electrify your buildings. You can put solar on your school buildings. You can upgrade your fleet vehicles to electric vehicles. Um, you can change your food purchasing policies to include more local um, organic foods and less meat. We have meatless Mondays. Uh, we have local Thursdays. Um, so yes, there's lots you can do even at the school board level to move a clean energy um, agenda. And then I'll allow other folks, what can folks do on park boards, school boards, et cetera? Um, want to echo everything that you just said, because there's a lot, there's a lot of ways we can address this, um, the climate crisis in a lot of different um, areas. I would say um, my, my word of caution um, to Sierra Club volunteers um, is to not stretch yourself too thin. Um, so yes, do the work in these areas, make the endorsements, um, but don't make endorsements in areas where you're not doing work, um, because then we can't follow through and, and hold folks accountable. Um, but it is a great way to expand where we're working. Um, and so, you know, if you want to endorse in an, in an area, if you want to endorse in a school board, just make sure that there is a plan at the chapter level to engage post-election once that person wins um, and make sure that, that that person is doing what they said that they would do. Great. Um, and then can we work at the level of curriculum? Um, I don't know, I don't know if anyone wants to answer this. I, I mean, I, encouraging the teaching of climate, you know, the climate yeah. crisis, sure. Um, no, I will add also for democracy, for example, in Nevada, we recently there was passed a law that uh, there should have civics classes included into the curriculum at the, the school uh, level, at the state level. So, uh, you know, even within the democracy space, there are also options of altering curriculum and encouraging uh, further education in those spaces. Great. Um, people are exhausted and frustrated by political polarization. How can LCB and Sierra Club bring people together, promote reconciliation, and bridge the great divide? Well, uh, I would just say, you know, obviously, we share the frustration at the federal level that, you know, climate and environmental justice policy has become so partisan over the last dozen plus years. Um, and there really are it is really hard to find Republicans to work with um, at the federal level. Last cycle, we did endorse uh, one Republican member of Congress, uh, Brian Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania. I think uh, though, you know, the, the good news is that, you know, voters aren't polarized around these issues. You know, they're very, there's broad and deep bipartisan support for clean energy uh, and climate action and investing in environmental justice. So, you know, focusing on, the, I think the, what we need to do is focus on the fact that people, no matter where you live, or which way you vote, need uh, clean air and clean water and um, access to public lands. And, and those are, I think, issues that can unify everyone. Anyone else? Okay, another easy question. <laughs> um, let's see, somebody asked in the chat um, something about Wisconsin. Um, oh, is fighting gerrymandering and encouraging fair maps a valid avenue to travel for the local Sierra Club group? Yes, definitely. It is such a big issue in Wisconsin, one of the worst gerrymandered states at every level. Definitely encourage you to lean into it. And then we have Jesus. I'm going to allow you to talk, Jesus, so you can answer, so you can ask your question. You need to unmute. 
Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Jesus Jesse Rosas. I'm running for city council for city of Los Angeles District 1. And my question is exactly, since you could divide in different chapters, how do you really give the support to other chapters to support uh, on the uh, other candidates that are running for local uh, districts? I noticed that you talk about a federal level, but you don't talk too much about local districts, which is very important, more important than federal to me, because that's the base of the clean air and pollutions and the, uh, and the communities. You know, I know the big companies, they do a lot of bad things, but eventually our communities need to learn more about the climate change, which is not doing it. And how you can help a person like myself and writing for city council with it's a grassroots who doesn't have no money, not too much volunteers, but it wants to do something for the community. How, how can you guys help? Thanks, Jesus. Um, I can start from the um, Sierra Club side. First off, Jesus, thank you so much for stepping up to run. Um, I know it takes quite a bit of, um, you know, vulnerability um, to, to step up and, and to put yourself out there like that. So thank you. Um, and thank you for uh, pointing out that I did not talk about what we do post endorsement down ballot um, at state and local level. Very similarly to our federal work, um, it, it, this will this will vary from district or from uh, chapter to chapter and group to group um, based on what their capacity is. Um, but across the board, if you are endorsed, um, you have access to communicate with our membership. Um, one time. And that's actually for a local race like yours, huge, um, because you can solicit our folks for donations and to volunteer for you. Um, so right out of the gates, you have an audience of people who are willing to help get you across the finish line. Um, depending on the race, depending on, on um, the chapter's capacity, it could also involve us doing some, you know, coordinated work with your campaign or on the independent side, um, you know, kind of helping on uh, on the other side of the firewall, so to speak. Um, but like I said, it, it will vary from, from chapter to chapter. Um, I can drop my email into the chat um, and I'd be happy to talk to you a little bit more about what um, your, you know, getting in touch with your chapter and, and um, go over kind of what your chapter's capacity might be. I'm actually going to share the screen that has all of our contact information um, so that you can you can contact any of us. Um, does anyone else want to share about local um, opportunities for local candidates? I, I would just say, um, you know, our state leagues, uh, you know, all, like I mentioned before, you know, handle things differently, but a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them do um, engage with local candidates we've done you know everything from you know like port commission races to power uh like bill mentioned uh you know utility boards uh and every you know city council so uh definitely you know if you live in a in are running in a state with a with one of our state affiliates definitely want would encourage you to reach out and if you have any trouble connecting you can contact me and i can help you and here's Craig's contact information along with the rest of us. Um, okay, we have a question about judicial um, elections. So what guidance would you offer uh, to, to getting, for getting potential endorsements for judicial elections? What are appropriate questions as judicial candidates may not wanna take specific positions on environmental policies? I think that's a great question. I think they're, you know, because of that, because of, as you just said, it's hard sometimes for judicial candidates to take positions. You know, I, I think there is a hesitancy a lot of times from groups like ours uh, to make endorsements, but, you know, I think that some of the, you know, I can't speak for all of our state leagues, some of them might. Um, and I do know that we have, some of our state leagues have spent money on independent expenditures in judicial races without making endorsements. And I do think there are, you know, we have a whole judiciary program at LCD um, that wants to educate the public about the importance of uh, the connection between the judiciary at the state and federal level with the with the environment and environmental justice. So 
I definitely think there are great uh, connections to be made. Uh, I think, unfortunately, with the upcoming West Virginia versus EPA Supreme Court case, it really shines a spotlight on the role the courts can play. Um, if you're not familiar, this case uh, might result in the Supreme Court saying that the EPA can't regulate greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a obviously it would be horrible if they uh, rule that way. But either way, you know, that this is also a moment to shine the spotlight for the public on why, you know, elected judge, you know, elected judges matter, but also, you know, obviously US Senate and and other races, state legislative races where or governor's races where people are appointing judges matters as well. In the Sierra Club, I I would actually advise against endorsing in those elections because it could inadvertently result in a judge, depending on what the state bar um, code of ethics is, having to recuse themselves from a case. Um, and at the Sierra Club, we have an environmental law program where we have staff attorneys, um, you know, arguing cases before judges that potentially have been elected. Um, and so we we could actually end up with inadvertently, you know, with a judge who's very opposed to what we are doing because we endorsed. So I, I actually would would really, if this is a Sierra Club person, feel free to email me. We can talk it through. But I across the board would advise against it. Okay. Well, I think we have answered all the questions. Um, so if, if there's anyone who has a last minute question, you can um, use the raise your hand button. But I think we've answered all the questions that were in the chat and the Q&A. Um, and if that's the case, I will say thank you so much to our panelists. This was a super interesting conversation for me. Um, and I hope it was helpful for everybody who attended. And especially want to thank Sierra Club. Um, this is the first time we've done one of these trainings together. And I think it was a smashing success, if I say so myself. Uh, so I think we should do more of them. Uh, I don't see any more hands raised in the chat. So everybody gets 15 minutes back on their day. You have a thank you from Los Osos. And uh, just great to see everybody. We will post this on the website when it's, when it's been suitably edited. And uh, just thanks so much everybody for the time and uh, chance to learn more together. Have a good day. <laughs>